Buenas, buenas. ¿Cómo andan? Bienvenidos a una nueva tarde de Casa con la CEU. Estamos arrancando el ciclo esta tarde. Hola, Consu, ¿cómo estás? ¿Estás por ahí? Sí, acá estoy. Hola, Fran, ¿cómo va? ¿Todo bien? ¿Cómo andan bueno, todos? Genial, bienvenidos. Genial. Hoy, hoy hacemos una charla muy especial, tenemos un invitado internacional eh, y hacemos también la actividad en conjunto. Consuelo es, de, es, de directora de la, de, es directora de Economía del Conocimiento del Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología, así que es una actividad en conjunto con la UTN. Así que bienvenidos también a este espacio y, y encantado de poder hacer este ciclo en conjunto. Gracias, muchas, muchas gracias. La verdad que estuvo bueno nosotros desde MinCIT, hacemos todo, igual que, que la CEU, un ciclo de webinars vinculados a ciencia y tecnología todos los días a las 4 de las 6 de la tarde, así que bueno, fue una muy buena idea eh, hacer un día en conjunto, así que muchas gracias a Oscar también por la invitación. Bueno, ge genial, genial, ahí estamos, Oscar estaba reiniciando la máquina, siempre nos pasa que pasa algo, ¿viste? Murphy aparece en estos casos, y, y estamos acá, vamos a ver si también está eh, Jessica eh, de IBM, pero bueno, ahí vamos, nuestro, nuestro invitado ya está en línea, Hi Nitin, ¿cómo estás? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Francisco, for the invitation, and good to see you again. Okay, great, great. Okay, we are. Okay, ahí se sumó, se sumó Oscar. Oscar ahí está. Se va, sumando la, se va sumando también la gente. Eh, estamos en vivo también para para YouTube, así que vamos. Así, bien, bienvenido. Les presento a Oscar Medina, también es del Centro de Innovación y Emprendimientos de, de Andén que es el, el lugar de la UTN de, de innovación. Y bienvenido, Oscar, también a este espacio. Hola, sí, buenas tardes a todos, muchas gracias. Eh, principalmente agradecer a, a Nitin eh, y a Jessica, pues, de parte de IBM, por habernos eh, tenido la generosidad de compartir esta charla. También a Consuelo Escribano y a Federico Sovich del Mincite Córdoba, por haber coorganizado junto con nosotros, y bueno, y ahí les van a contar que al final después, eh, cómo vamos a tener esta charla traducida en nuestros canales de, de YouTube, y bueno, a vos Francisco y a todo el equipo de UTN por habernos dado este lugar para, para dar esta, esta charla técnica, este, que bueno, que consideramos muy importante para los que estamos en este tema. Muchas gracias a todos y bienvenidos nuevamente al, al ciclo de En Casa con la CEP. Bueno, bueno, excelente. Si sí, vamos, ya somos, somos unos cuantos acá, ya estamos llegando a, a 50 personas y, y, en, y en YouTube también eh, somos, estamos alrededor de las 75, 80 personas, así que vamos, vamos a comenzar. Ese es su modo Jessica, también vamos a hacerla con anfitrión. Ahí está. Jessica, bienvenida. Hola, ¿cómo están? Gracias. Bueno, Jessica es responsable de relaciones académicas de IBM Argentina. Y por eso también pudo hacer el nexo. Entonces, gracias también por esta oportunidad. Gracias a Nitin, <ríe> básicamente, y a ustedes por invitarnos y organizarlo. Así que, nada, yo acá, eh, a sus órdenes. Ok, genial. Como, como, como decía Oscar adelantaba, esta charla va a ser en inglés. Eh, así que de, después en nuestro canal de YouTube van a estar, va a estar subtitulada y, y traducida para, para después repasarla también, tanto en nuestro canal como en el canal de del Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología de la provincia de Córdoba. Bueno, ¿te parece, Consu, que, que, arra que arranquemos sí, un poco la presentación? Arranca. Sí, lo que sí sepan que va a estar abierto el chat tanto de Zoom como de YouTube Live, así que si quieren pueden ir dejando sus preguntas, como esta charla va a ser en inglés, ahora ya estamos por poner el switch y ya arrancamos en inglés, lo ideal sería que directamente hagan las preguntas en inglés, así se las podemos eh, leer a, a Niren también. Bien, perfecto. Exactamente, te me adelantaste y vamos Perdón. a unas recomendaciones que siempre les hago a todo el mundo antes de la charla. Es, va a ser de 30 minutos y después intercambio de preguntas. Para eso usamos el, el, el espacio de chat de Zoom de YouTube para hacer preguntas. Nosotros vamos relevando y después lo vamos, este, le vamos a hacer las preguntas a Nitin. Eh, la sesión va a estar inmediatamente disponible en nuestro canal de YouTube, no subtitulada, pero después vamos a agregar los subtítulos. Pueden suscribirse al canal, dejar me gusta comentarios en los videos, que, que está bueno, eh, si les gusta también para posicionar nuestro contenido, y hay mucho también de otras conversaciones, de otras charlas que hemos tenido, pueden repasar ahí nuestro contenido. Aprovechemos para la co-creación, compartamos información, seguramente hay mucha gente de la temática escuchando, así que está bueno por ahí eh, también compartir datos de interés a medida que vayamos conversando, que, que puede ser muy, de mucha utilidad. 
Y cuando finalice la charla, a los inscriptos les va a llegar una pequeña encuesta. Para nosotros va a ser muy importante para, para evaluar y, y de esta manera también seguir mejorando estos espacios de conversación. Simplemente les dejamos nuestras cuentas de, de Instagram, de Twitter, para que, para que nos etiqueten, para que compartan en redes también, es que siempre está bueno difundir un poco más, compartir lo que estamos haciendo y cómo nos estamos formando. Dejamos ahí las, las cuentas para, para seguirnos y para que también sigan, eh, porque hay mucha actividad tanto del Ministerio como de la Secretaría de Extensión eh, relacionado a estos temas y más eh, que en este tiempo de pandemia y, y cuarentena para poder seguir aprendiendo. Y ahora sí. Let's go, let's make the switch. Let's talk in English. <laughs> And Nitin, let's get uh, this party started. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're welcome. And let's, let's talk about blockchain. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, I, I, I'm so happy to be here. Actually, I was hoping when, you know, I'm hoping everybody on the call is safe. It's a crazy time with COVID-19, so I'm hoping everybody's safe, especially in South America where you're still transitioning to the to a different season. But I wish we could do this in person in, in Argentina because that's one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, so, but maybe next time we do this in person, but um, this is an interesting time. Um, I'm going to spend some time on this call in talking about the difference between, and I have used the word addressing trust divide between what's happening in the enterprise blockchain world and what's happening in the crypto world, which is the Bitcoin, Ethereum. And this is a very interesting time because this week uh, we have consensus, uh, which is one of the biggest blockchain conferences, usually in New York. Uh, it's happening online. It's virtual, it's free. And so if you are interested, it's going to go on for two more days. But uh, I have about 14 slides, so I'm going to spend about 35 to 40 minutes in talking about my experience and what me and my global team have done over the past six years or seven years in enterprise blockchain space. We have seen a massive transformation and hopefully that experience is not only educational for many of you, but also inspirational because we have learned a lot of things and I have tried to include that learning in 14 slides, which is not fair, but it's the time we have and we need to make sure that we have the best of it. So I'm gonna first start with what are we doing with blockchain? And, and something that I oftentimes use as the most simple definition or the best definition, because when we look at simplicity of this complex technology of blockchain, we are really solving for two things in the world. We are solving for time and we are solving for trust. And that's basically the foundation of blockchain technology, regardless of all the complex things that you hear with Bitcoin and with Ethereum and with Hyperledger and many of the technologies, at the end of the day, uh, we are solving for these two issues of time and trust. And if there's a message that you should take for especially the newcomers in the space is these are the two things we are solving for. And the cost of time and trust is huge. Uh, it's huge for the, every industry. The time it takes for shipment of goods, the time it takes for movement of money and the parties who are involved in between with this financial services, whether it's banks, uh, shipping companies for movement of goods, there's a cost to it. There's a cost to me and you as consumers, but the industry has a massive cost of the fact that money takes time to move between parties. And uh, that's true for now. And when the money moves from, let's say two different countries for a short amount of time, the money is not available. And there's a cost of that money not being available to the end consumers. Uh, there's, a, there's a locked capital problem when we move money. And same thing when we move goods or supply chain Uh, that not having information about where the goods are and if the goods are uh, potentially going through a hazardous routes, uh, that has a massive cost to the industry. So time and trust are two things that we are trying to solve. And I also use this two concepts to, when I'm looking at problems and I'm talking to my customers, is that 
can we solve many of the issues? And these two sort of, uh, you know, I, I use this as a, as a, you know, as a litmus test. And this is about two years old, but I think it's still relevant. And I usually use this to make an impact. Um, what is the impact of blockchain on the economy? What is the impact of blockchain on different industries? And by 2025, uh, some of the source of this information is from World Economic Forum. Some is from IBM Research. Some we have taken information from Gartner and so on and so forth. These are all think tank and research studies, but some information is interesting. 10% of GDP will be stored in blockchain by 2025. That's in five years. We expect 10% of GDP, which is in you know, a collective GDP is about six to seven trillion globally. Even if 10% of that is on blockchain, that's a huge, huge amount. Uh, the 2.3 billion number is interesting to technology companies. Uh, IBM, we're a technology company, and this number has increased now to close to about $6.7 billion uh, that allows companies like IBM, Microsoft, Oracle to go after the business uh, that is that big. So it's interesting for technology companies. And of course, uh, we talk about banks. Uh, banks uh, are perceived to be a industry that is very much disruptive because of blockchain going forward. And pretty much, I would say that 90% of our customers are financial services and banks, and we expect a massive uptake of technology. And I'm just gonna spend some more time on the use cases. But what's interesting to me is the second number, the $176 billion number. And sometimes I focus on that is because that is the new business model that blockchain makes possible. That is the new structure which doesn't exist today. That's the next generation of Amazon and the old eBay and the newer model of what we see with Square and PayPal of the world. That business doesn't exist today. And so what's interesting to me is not the technology spend and GDP, all that is good. What's interesting to me is what blockchain will do just like what internet has done to make many online businesses possible. And I will spend some time and give you examples. I see it in front of my eyes that there are newer and newer business models coming into the industry, which simply don't exist or which have not existed in the last decade or so. And that is why it's interesting to me personally. So at the end of the day, we, talk about what is blockchain. And these are some of the examples that you see because it's blockchain is nothing but a combination of various technologies that includes cryptography, that includes a shared database, that includes a massive network communication, all that combined makes blockchain as a combination of technologies. But that combination leads to a platform, platform for a trusted digital transaction system. So it is a, it is a transaction system. It is not uh, something which is magical. Uh, basically a transaction happens every time uh, we trade, we move money, we move anything of value. That movement of value requires a transaction. So you go to a bank or you use a credit card, that's a transaction. You send money, that's a transaction. You deposit money, that's a transaction. So blockchain is meant to be a platform for trusted digital transaction system. Today, these transaction systems are spread across various entities and we are connecting these various banks and financial institutions uh, through some messaging system. And the idea of blockchain is to bring all that into a single uh, trusted transaction system. So that's one data point. Second thing is because it has built-in trust, it's supposed to do disintermediation. And it's, it's, uh, it's a big term uh, for especially non-speaking English speaking countries, but basically we are trying to remove the middleman because in many cases you will find that by notion of time and trust, which is the first two things we did, there are many brokers. Um, and with internet, many brokers are gone. Uh, we don't have travel agents sitting anymore. We all do it online uh, because they were information brokers. And like that, there are many brokers who are in between value transfers. And we believe that those brokers because of blockchain will go away. And that includes some functions of banking, 
some function of stock trades, some functions of movement of things of value. Uh, and that's why we use the word disintermediation that many business networks will remove some of the old middlemen, but maybe introduce new ones. And I'll spend some time on that. It's also a marketplace. Um, you are creating a network of multiple parties who are trying to transact and move things of value. It is also a digital marketplace. And because it's a digital marketplace, you have enormous amount of potential to start doing what we call co-creation. Co-creation is, again, giving birth to a new model, a new business, a new concept that didn't exist before today. Uh, so these are the few things that I would want the audience to take away that because of these reasons, these foundational fundamental reasons, why we think blockchain as a technology itself is important. But again, uh, technology itself doesn't do anything. You need a platform which uses the technology to enable some of these things. Now, I wanted to include this slide because um, these are the industries um, that from past six or seven years that we have been involved. These are proven use cases that the industry has verified blockchain to be the right technology to disrupt and transform. Not only the industry, but also the disruptive forces, these are the startup companies like FinTech and health tech and rec tech companies who are trying to disrupt uh, the industries. These are the use cases that we have gone over again, where we have seen billions of dollars going into these use cases to either transform an industry or to disrupt an industry by startup companies. And the reason why I present this is because uh, you see the impact of blockchain technology in many, many sectors, not just financial services. We see in healthcare, supply chain, insurance, capital markets, manufacturing, especially in a case of supply chain, healthcare and banking. And so uh, this, this data is important, especially for venture capital communities and technology communities, because these are proven use cases. And we have seen early days, all the new cases require a massive investment into proof of concepts, MVPs. And we have gone through that learning and these are verified use cases by the industries. So it's a good data point to have from a perspective of what is the areas, whether you are a professional working in that area or you're a student who wants to enter the area, these are good areas to explore only because investment jobs uh, are being focused and created in these areas uh, as a part of industry transformation. Um, me and my team, I, I, I founded the IBM Blockchain Labs and IBM in 2015, 2016, early days. Um, and then uh, recently I've also formed uh, IBM Digital Asset Labs. And this is a summary of my team's work or IBM's work, including our labs and our services. And this is a sample of some of the very big names that we have worked, uh, which is an example from the previous slides of the industries, the big names, the use cases, and I would encourage the audience to Google some of these names. Um, you know, especially, for example, we work with Bolsa de Santiago in Chile, which is a neighboring country on modernizing some of the facets of capital markets from a stock exchange perspective. We have worked with Northern Trust to create what we call a private equity marketplace, which was the first of a kind in an area which is super driven with paper, right? So it was a very paper driven industry and one element of blockchain is to be able to digitize an industry before we tokenize them. And I'm, I'm gonna spend some time on that. But what's more important is some of the government projects. And I have personally been involved with, again, some agencies in Argentina and Chile and in, 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 in uh, Brazil uh, on the government work. So Smart Dubai is something you should look into where the government of Dubai wants it to be the happiest place on earth, which is funny because we think it's Disney World, but Dubai wants to be the happiest place on earth. And they want to digitize the entire process of identity, of buying a car, renting an apartment, everything on a single digital blockchain, which makes the life of people living in the country simple. 
You don't have to deal with bureaucracy, no government policies. Your ability to rent an apartment is a matter of hours, which today takes about six weeks. It takes six weeks to rent an apartment in Dubai. The idea behind some of the digital process from a trust perspective is to create a model which will essentially um, make this, which will make this a, um, a, a model that will allow them to be able to digitize the entire process. So it's something you should Google and look into. And of course, some of these examples are putting diamond blockchain, uh, loyalty programs, payments, uh, rich with use cases, but these are examples that companies have invested significant amount of money in not only refining the use case, but bringing those use cases to production. Now, if you all remember, I talked about a number called $178 billion, which is new businesses that don't exist today. And this is an example of what that means. So on the left-hand side, my left-hand side, you find global trade. And global trade is uh, IBM working with Maersk and many shipping companies have built a trade digitization network which is trying to digitize the entire movement of goods. So as you look at movement of goods, so our economy or any world's economy is reliant upon movement of goods and movement of money. That's how the basic economic function works. And movement of, let's say, avocados from Peru to the United States, for example, one container is $4 million. If a container is missing, well, avocados go bad in a week. And so there's a massive economic loss so what we are trying to do with global trade is make sure that the ocean carriers, airline, freight forwarders are on the same blockchain network. So we can track and trace and reduce the paperwork required for tracking and tracing because today, believe it or not, there are people going with paperwork, flying from port to port to get signatures and we are trying to digitize that process and make it more efficient and visible for financial services industry. On the right-hand side, you find the financial services with, for trade finance. So when you move goods like avocados from Peru, uh, so the shipper will have to basically, uh, the importer exporter would have to get some banking commitments because the money has to move between two unknown people in two unknown lands. And so the financial services, which finances the trade has to verify all the information, has to verify the paperwork, has to verify bill of lading, has to make sure there's no fraud. And that has thousands of thousands of people involved simply doing phone calls and verification of these paper processes. So the idea behind global trade digitization is to digitize the flow of goods. The idea of financial services is to digitize the verification process and movement of money. But in between is the new industry that doesn't exist today then these new industries are things like supply chain financing, invoice financing, and creating new businesses by providing short-term loans to shippers because they are small businesses, they are farmers. And basically, because we can track and trace containers of avocados, we can start releasing small amounts of money. And because we have visibility of how many containers are coming, the uh, the warehouses can repurpose the warehouses for avocados or for flowers or whatever is coming in real time. Right now, you have different containers, different shipping ports, different warehouses for different goods. And the idea is that I can create new consumer industries, new warehouse industries, new wholesale industries, which today does not exist. Uh, so this is something which I think should be interesting for not just repurposing the warehousing, but creating new financial services for providing small term loans for farmers and agriculture products, providing SME loans, uh, providing invoice financing, and then creating new products of what we call securitization, which is basically packaging these small debts and selling into capital markets, thereby creating more flow of money into the system, which I think is a really, really critical part, especially now, because in COVID-19, supply chain is very, very important. And if you don't trust a supplier, it's hard to do business. So in this area, we are creating what we call a trust your supplier, which makes the process of 
trusting a party much faster than exchanging paperwork. And that is something which I think is truly revolution in terms of, again, saving time because we're doing this digitally, but also inducing trust in the system because blockchain enables you to prevent fraud uh, from a digital asset perspective. So really, really important topic that I, I would like the audience to take it with them. But um, this is interesting, especially this week, given that we have new startup companies popping up every day, is while me and my cohorts and my professional connections in IBM and Microsoft and folks are focusing on the enterprise world of manufacturing, financial services, supply chain, there is this amazing crypto world, which is driven by many of the fundamental technologists who are inspired by the revolution for blockchain, Ethereum. And every industry that I showed you, including ours as technology company, has a startup company that you see here who are providing capital liquidity, who are providing protocol infrastructures, who are providing applications. These are all small companies who are trying to disrupt every single business that we talked about in the previous slides, in healthcare, in regulation, in financial services, in payments, and including technology, which is IBM space and Microsoft, the big, the big tech. And what's interesting to me is you have two sides. One is the enterprise, which is trying to modernize and become better. And one is the startup community that is trying to change the world as we see it. So these two are investing equal amount of money on both sides, which is why I think this is super exciting for, for many of us in the industry, because you see very fast technology innovation that is happening by this community, because they want to do something better, something faster, something unique, whereas the enterprises want to simply stay in business and bring that innovation to that business. So, the divide, which is the topic of this uh, discussion. Well, we have blockchain of every industry, supply chain, government, retail, payments, insurance, banking, but this crazy crypto world that's innovating at a much faster pace. As a technologist and as a person who's working with the industry, I want to be able to understand the difference, but I also want to steal the innovation. I want to learn from what's happening in the right-hand side and take the technology and apply it meaningfully to the left-hand side to be able to create new innovation, new models. And the more knowledge we have of the various layers, what you see on the right-hand side are the various blockchain technologies and various blockchain layers from permissioning private P2P network. I wanna be able to take the layers and apply them meaningfully in these different industries uh, to be able to understand the difference, but bring the difference together in taking advantage of the community and, add, and, and the technology innovation at the same time. Now, one thing we haven't talked about is money. Uh, and this is something which I'm moving into a new area that we talked about innovation in many industries. We talked about movement of value. So movement of value means anything that's valued to the industry, which means gold, diamond, uh, stock certificates and papers and bill of lading. But every network needs to deal with, with money because money is a common uh, source, which we use the word fungible. Fungible mini means that we are not doing barter anymore. We are using cash and money as a common unit to exchange value. So if you go to buy uh, apples, you give them cash, uh, you don't exchange apples with your widgets or you don't exchange apples with your books. Uh, you use money as a common theme and the money itself is going through a lot of revolutionary changes. So this, I've spent nine months of my life in focusing on digitizing fiat. There are many projects, including in some parts of Chile, we have heard just light conversation in Argentina about CBDC or central bank digital currency. But imagine this, if I'm digitizing everything and I'm transferring assets and value, whether it's stocks or bonds or digital version of containers or diamonds on the network, but I have to get paid and I have to wait for that money to take seven days. 
then what have we solved? What are we solving if I have to wait for seven days or 10 days to move the money? So I have not really solved the issue of time. And so essentially what we're trying to do is understand the notion of digital fiat or tokenized fiat and understand the various elements of various currency options available for us, which means that we are doing these things the right way, the regulated way with the banking system and figuring out, can we move money at the same speed at which we are trying to move digital assets and digital forms of assets, which is tokenized version of physical assets, containers and gold and diamonds. And so this is from Bank of International Settlement. I would urge you to spend some time on this in understanding the various complexity of money because everything that I've designed from a business perspective, a business network, I absolutely have to spend time on understanding the connection to the banking system, the connection to moving fiat or moving cash, moving money on, on the network. And I think this is important because at the end of the day, um, it's pesos or dollars, they're the ones that actually have to exchange hands for everything that we, that we move around the economy. So movement of goods and movement of money are the foundational elements of, of the economic activity and moving cash becomes really, really important in of course a compliant way. So I begin to question things that I wanna go back to basics because I think we have tried to solve with a lot of te technology, again, coming from the crypto world in trying to create tokens and trying to create coins and trying to figure out a mechanism. And I think if we are only solving one part of the equation of movement of whether it's anything of value, but not solving the regulation compliance and movement of money, then we are, we are only solving one part and we are not solving the full problem. So I wanna go back to fundamental tenets of blockchain, the basic tenets of blockchain, which is trade trust ownership. So any use case, it should have at least these three components, trade trust ownership of anything of value. Otherwise we can use a database, we don't need blockchain. Second thing is we have to understand duality of transactions. So every time I'm exchanging my house or rent or money, I'm exchanging two things in value. If I'm giving, if I'm selling uh, Francisco my car, I want Francisco to pay me in cash or something else of value, and that's an exchange. So I have to not solve only transferring car. I also have to figure out how do I get the money in return. I also have to what we call as tokenizing an asset, which means I'm building a digital world. I have to create a digital twin or a digital version of a physical asset. Now, most important part, which is I think is a really, really important part is digital identity. If I'm creating a digital asset, I cannot assign that to a driver's license or a passport. I need a digital version of you. I need to make sure that the participation of the ecosystem as I'm creating this digital asset and assigning digital assets is through the notion of digital identification of individuals, which usually is should come from the state because today your passport and driver's license is coming from your county or your country. And if all we are doing is reconciling ledgers, which is what many, many blockchain projects have done, then that is something we can solve with the distributed database. We don't need blockchain. And so digital fiat, digital identity become the two really, really critical part for solving the bigger part of the equation. And if we don't solve them, then we are creating good, amazing experiments, but we're not solving the real problem. So my focus, and this should be something which I have researched over and over again, I've been working on this for some time. These are the six areas that I want me, my team and the community to focus on. It's digital identity, which is again, uh, if we want the entire world to participate, then we have to figure out how do we simplify the notion of digital identity so I can then create digital assets and assign the ownership of digital assets to digital version of me and Francisco and Jessica and everybody else. Uh, and so the digital identity becomes important. Digital fiat is equally important because I need a universal measurement of account, which is money. So I need to move money fast and that is as important as identity 
Because if I'm buying and selling things on a marketplace, I need a common currency to move, whether it's dollar or pesos or euros or yen, I still need to have digital version of it. I cannot send money and wait for seven days while I'm transferring asset. And the next two, which is asset tokenization and security design are technical challenges. So people who are technical on the call, spend time on these two things. These two are really, really critical element of you having uh, the jobs of the future or focusing on addressing the right elements of ensuring the digital manifestation of tokenization of an asset. And because we are building this on internet, which is still the combination of technologies of providing network technologies, we have to make sure that we are plugging not only the security holes of today's technologies, but also uh, creating an asset and keeping asset on network uh, exposes that to a, to a larger extent. So security design is super, super important from technology perspective for blockchain networks. And the remaining two are really, really issue for business analysts and project managers is uh, understanding the business models, um, especially for the enterprise, who makes money, how you make money, and how do you make money in a way that keeps the network running because you cannot cheat the system, you have to create the right incentive economic model. And the governance to me is the single most problem why most blockchain projects fail is because you don't have a governance structure. So these six areas, in my opinion, is something which every blockchain professional should understand, consider and learn in terms of what's happening in these areas. Um, by the way, connect with me on LinkedIn. I write about this quite a bit. I've written papers and I've written actually a book uh, that talks about all the six areas and gives you more detail. Uh, so I encourage you to connect with me and, and keep the conversation going on LinkedIn or Twitter or any of the social sort of media platforms. Um, and I believe that, you know, I wrote a paper on this topic of design principles of sustainable blockchain networks. Um, of course, there are more but seven is a good number and I figured we keep it short and, 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 and meaningful that I use this for most of my blockchain projects as some of the design principles and design principles keeps us on check, keeps us focused on the problem um, as opposed to addressing some of the other elements around it. Um, I have one more slide uh, and then I'm gonna open for Q and A is, so I wrote a paper on this topic too is how do big corporations um, understand and adopt blockchain networks. And it's an interesting problem because big corporations have a business to run. Blockchain is maybe not the highest priority. So how do we um, take the projects and run them? And this basically uh, is something which we have proven methodology that spend more time guys on figuring out the right use case. I have seen many projects who could use the database but they chose blockchain only to fail in the next stage. So spend most of your time upfront in finding the right use case and make sure that you're having meaningful uh, ecosystem that you're creating. Because if it's, a, if it's a use case for a single company, then chances are you don't need blockchain because we are trying to build an ecosystem and marketplace, which means you need more than one participants of the industry. Same thing with then building a business blueprint because if the business doesn't, if there's no business blueprint, then the question is who's gonna pay for it? Because we have to invest money in technology and professionals and time. So it's really, really important to make sure that you have a business blueprint, which defines the sustainability of the network as to who pays for resources, what is the economic structure, whether it's token-based or permission-based network that the enterprise is creating. And then we focus on technology. So you realize that I'm, build, I'm focusing on, even though I'm a te technologist, I'm an engineer, but my technology is the, is the second, of, second step before going into this is I'm focusing technology after I have figured out the business case and business blueprint. Then I focus on building a technology proof, uh, blueprint and then focusing on which is the right technology, whether it's Ethereum or EOS or Hyperledger Fabric or Hyperledger Besu or Enterprise. So there's a whole slew of many, many technologies. I want to first create a blueprint and then see which is the right technology choice to use for that. And then remember this, most money that enterprise spends is integration, even today, because we live in a world, there are banks, there are supply chain, there are systems. So when you're building a new system, 
you still need to integrate with the existing systems. And majority of the cost goes into enterprise integration. So keep that in mind as you're designing the systems that oftentimes many use cases die with the POC because people have not considered these things. And as professionals, I think you should consider these things as knowledgeable people to provide the right advisory to your clients and to your, to your businesses and so on and so forth. And with that, I'll leave it up to the last page where I captured some of the things that we're discussing here, including some real world use cases, some of the business models, technology fundamentals. So this book is really meant for any professional, whether it's business and technology, for you to understand uh, various elements around it. Um, so I think if you go to IBM and search for this, you can get a few chapters for free. My idea is not to promote the book or make money from the book or anything, it's just uh, intellectual exercise. But the idea is that you can get some free chapters from IBM website, just Google blockchain for business IBM and you'll be able to go and register and you'll, you'll get a few chapters, which should be good enough as a starting point. So with that, um, I hope this was good use of your time because I cannot give you 41 minutes back of your life. And I'm hoping that this was a good use of your time and you learned something and I'm open to conversations and, and any Q and A on that. So Francisco, back to you. Okay, Nadine, thank you. Thank you very much. For me, it was the, the first time that I, I'm here about blockchain without a code or without focusing in, in the blocks and uh, in, in the chain. So uh, it was really, really rich for me. And I think for all the people who is in, in the room. What do you think, uh, Consul? No, it, it was really good. Thank you. Thank you, Nidan. Uh, actually, now uh, why we... Uh, we are doing this together as well. It's because we're working, like developing like a hub in Cordoba of blockchain. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons we're doing because a part of uh, creating this hub with the universities, the companies, the chambers and clusters that are uh, working in this hub is part of first explaining to everyone what blockchain is about. And uh, I think that was really good about uh, um, this webinar today is that uh, you're actually also like going uh, like moving forward into the future, what can happen uh, with it, like in the future, near future, five years. So I think that was really good to give us like prospects of what can come up uh, about blockchain. I think that there are some questions, uh, Fran, that maybe we can read. Remember, you yes. can put your questions in the yes. chat I, I will, here Zoom. See. I will start with one personal question and then we, Great. we let the people to, to write there. And uh, I will ask you, um, what does the blockchain world needs right now? Needs developers, needs like business thinkers, designers, or, or clients? So, clients that understand the, the product. So I think the, the romance is over of blockchain, that you could just throw blockchain and you get attention. I think there's a lot of, of that stuff. So here's what I think is what's going on, right? Is from a technology wise, you have a lot of development skills that's available, I think, because the technology that's used in blockchain space from programming perspective is the same. You have Golang, you have Java, from, for example, Coda, R3 is focused on Java. We are for having Java and Golang and many of the developing piece, which means if you understand the programming language and someone tells you what to do from an architecture perspective, you can build it. I think the skill that's missing and that's missing for most big projects is the true sense of blockchain project management and blockchain architects. And I'll tell you what that means. So blockchain, as you know, is a combination of technologies. It's not just one technology, there are many technologies. So you need a systems level thinking. What I mean by that is it's a system, this input, this output, and there are various things that happen in between. So a person with a blockchain architect has to think about security, performance, throughput, um, figuring out the integration points and figuring out the trust that's in between and consensus mechanisms, all the code stuff that needs to figure out is what does the system do and remember, blockchain network is organic, it grows. So every time I add two participants or three participants, the technical impact is massive because every time I add a participant, the network keeps growing. And as the network grows, how do I, how does, so architect's role or job is to keep in mind to provide consistent performance, consistent security, and keep up with the changes in technology. And that's what architect does and directing the team of developers and, and system admins to build or keep the system up and running. And blockchain project management 
is another area I think is critical because blockchain is not just about technology or digitizing business. You have many legal questions that come up. So it's techno business and legal issues that come up in blockchain world. Because if you're introducing token, for example, as a part of your network, then is token a utility token? Is it a money token? Is it a security? And depending on what your answer is, you have to figure out the compliance and regulatory element because if it's money, then you need to get licensing because you're moving money. If it's a security or if it, if it offers like, you know, what many of the ERC projects, ERC is an Ethereum project, they become a security, which means you invest into it and you get rewards later. Uh, and depending on where things are, it may affect you legally. Uh, it may also affect you from a business perspective in terms of, so business, business, technical and legal are something which is a consideration for ongoing requirements of a network. Because when network grows, it's a requirement changes over time and you have to be careful of introducing the elements of things like what does a token do? So we talk about asset tokenization and technically we all will be happy because it's easy to do. It's easy to tokenize things, but what does a token mean? And what do I need to do from a legal perspective? How do I create information and data so I can provide compliance systems? And that's what a role of a blockchain technology project manager is. So architect maintains the big level picture and the project, our project te technology uh, project manager or offering manager needs to know about the uh, evolution of regulatory landscape, if you're using token or not, and the what we call as the rules of engagement or participants, how do you govern the network? So governance is a big, big part of it. And it is the project manager's role to make sure the governance is up to date. So those two are really, and, and developers, of course, always important because they change the world. But to me, for most blockchain network level, you need a highly skilled architects to make it successful and good offering manager or project leads to understand the governance and the business and legal part of every network, if that makes sense. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, here we have a... But I'm, can I ask a question before we go? Uh, I see this, this uh, yes. some questions, but I have just one small question, Sneden. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you talk about uh, new model, new business models uh, yeah. where blockchain will have like uh, an important role, let's say. Uh, I'm not asking about the future, but uh, do you have an opinion on um, how these new business models uh, will be or related yeah, yeah. to what kind of uh, characteristics? We do. If you, if you look into the space of what we call DeFi, or so de decentralized financing. So okay. decentralized financing is sort of creating financial models uh, that is universally available to all. And I'll give you a simple example. There's something examples for DeFi. There are examples for what we call STO, which is security token offering space. But imagine this, right? Simple, if you create the right infrastructure that anybody in the world should be able to invest. So you're in Argentina and you find something attractive in the US. Well, today as an individual, uh, right? For you to invest in the US market, it's impossible for a common people because you had to go have a brokerage account. But imagine if you could have a small piece of token. So I have a token for, a, for, a, for IBM stock and I can, take, I can take the IBM stock into 100 pieces and create a small fraction of the token and you can own that sitting in Argentina without going through a massive investment banking and five banking infrastructure, I think that's the impact, right? And we all do it in a legal compliant way that you, we adhere to the Argentinian legal system and the US legal system, but still facilitate the ownership of token in your name. I think that is the impact we're looking at. But if imagine if I can enable you as a student or as a professional working in, in Cordoba, then the globe has 7 trillion people. That's a marketplace for 7 trillion people who can participate in an economic system, which today is only available to few, which is not fair, I think. So whether it's $100 or 100 Nairas or 100 pesos, you should be able to make that investment anywhere in the world without having a massive bank account and having massive requirements. And that's what I think we're trying to achieve with this. So there are many DeFi projects who are technically open because blockchain technology enables it to make it happen. We simply have to figure out the governance and compliance system that we're not breaking any laws and still facilitating your participation in the global economy. 
for example. So the DeFi or decentralized financing projects and STO is, are some of the examples of this new business models that have not existed before. Thank you. Okay. There is some question, um, one from Jose. It's, uh, um, you believe that blockchain is also applicable in justice service, specifically in forensic informatics, for example. Ah, oh, that's a good one. Um, so we, of course, uh, if you spend enough time in, in, in blockchain world, you realize that, um, that um, we have seen all the use cases. So we have worked with, um, of course, uh, with the US defense uh, and the FBI's of the world is, what is the element of forensic science? And so I'll give, an, I'll give an example and then we'll go from there. But sometimes I think blockchain can be overkill. Uh, because there are many other technologies like, you know, immutable databases that can do the same function. So in many cases in forensic space that you, or forensic informatics space or any informatics space, we're looking at a few things. We're looking at verification validation as two components, but we're also looking at chain of custody, like who really had this particular, um, so there's an analytical component of it, which is the informatic part of it, and this chain of custody of the forensics that go into it. And one thing blockchain does is it creates transparency in terms of who did what on the network. So it becomes hard to tamper with evidence and it ensures that people who are dealing with informatics, which is basically dealing with the data related to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, evidence, for example, uh, which is forensics evidence, that data is in the system and there's a, there's a, there's a chain of custody of the data in terms of who did what which allows the analysis at a much faster pace. And that way, think of it as you creating an internal ecosystem of the investigative agencies, the analysis agencies, the forensic ecosystem, and they all can basically put the information without actually having to deal with paperwork, which is what we do today with files, and having the risk of, of people tampering with that files and evidences, which creates the legal delivery of justice as a, at, at a, at a you know, at a disadvantage. But if you ask me that becomes a high priority, I mean, I technically I could design the system using a good uh, distributed database systems um, and blockchain becomes an overkill in some cases. And I believe the forensic system is one of those use cases where I can take something like a QLDB, which is a, a immutable database, which gives me the historical record of what has happened without the cost of consensus, without the requirement of tokens without the requirement and I can put all the agencies to put the information in this immutable database, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another question from Luciano. Uh, he's asking, what do you think about blockchain in the traditional production uh, system? How do you think the technology will change the factory jobs? Or so I powers? think, um, so traditional systems, that's a broad question from technology perspective. Um, I still think that blockchain systems will still need to be managed, which means there'll be data centers, there'll be servers, whether it's cloud or whether it's people, set of people managing it. And we believe that there'll be new jobs created, just like every new technology creates new jobs and some jobs go away. An example is how many, I don't know how many of you go to a travel agent, but we all go online and, and buy tickets in hotels, right? Uh, but there was a time when you could go to a travel agent, sit in his office and book tickets and, and, and stuff. And maybe some people are young, they have not seen it. And I'm, maybe I'm getting a little older and I've seen that when I was young, is I would go to a shop and book a ticket, which was not happening today anymore. Similarly, um, new jobs get created. And I believe that network, network operation centers, so each blockchain is a network and network requires governance, network requires SLA or service level agreement management security. So I believe every blockchain network will change the, jobs to a point where you'll be assigned to a network to manage the health of the network, as opposed to managing a massive data center and managing the IT resources. But you still need IT, you still need machines, except that your focus in my opinion, at least what we are staffing for projects are network focused projects that you're assigned to a network and you're managing the network because that itself is a, is a management component. So you'll start seeing new roles emerging as blockchain ecosystems evolve and develop, if that makes sense. Okay, cool, cool. Um, an another question. Um, I, okay, the, the technology, it's okay, it's safe. We understand that. 
But for example, which are the um, con uh, elements of control for the people who is, is not in the technology to, uh, to trust in, 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 the, in the system of blockchain, okay? If you are a client and you, 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 you come here with technology, with blockchain, with a project, which are the control systems or how we can trust in the people who uh, make the codes? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. If you look at this governance model, right? Governance is supposed to decide all that stuff. So the common theme is that you build a network and I'll give you an example here, right? Um, so let's say this is a network, right? You have a network of, of, this is a good example. So I have network of enterprise blockchain network with different systems in the network. Of course, if I look at the outside, what we use the periphery of it, not everybody has to be on blockchain. So I could have multiple participants. So these are multiple participants and they can access the system via set of APIs. Or of course, if you're banking Francisco with say Banco de Galicia, for example, right? You may have credentials, you may log on to the bank. The bank knows who you are and they can, but when bank has to submit transition to the network, to move money from say Cordoba to, to Buenos Aires as a transfer system, then bank can do interbank. So that can happen on blockchain, but your interaction with bank can happen through API. That way, when bank submits a transaction to the blockchain network, we are holding the bank accountable and a bank responsible. And that way we can control the control points of relationships that the banks and financial institutions or any participant maintains and they can basically prove that this money was sent by Francisco to Nitin, for example, and blockchain network can simply process and record the transaction. But one thing is really, really important that anything to do with blockchain network, because we are, again, solving the issue of trust and time, whether a person is querying or submitting transactions, they have to be a trusted entity. So there's an onboarding mechanism that you onboard every player on blockchain network after verifying their requirement and verifying their identity, whether it's a company or individual. Otherwise, you begin to lose the system, especially for the system that they're building. So even in Bitcoin, for example, which is a what we call a trustless system, that then there's no verification of you, but you still need a wallet. You still need a wallet to join the system and be able to hold a coin, for example, yeah. or be a miner. And that's the control mechanism they use in a trustless system. And the model is different, but for most enterprises, you need to legally and for the sake of governance, verify the identity of companies and individuals who are on the network. And that's how you control those elements. And then the system itself provides a lot of capabilities and makes life easier from verification, validation, many of the functions, but you still need to device an onboarding system so you can control that piece. If that makes sense. But there is there is a question from YouTube, and and say and ask you what are the reasons for IBM partnering with a cryptocurrency like Stellar. It's a good question. So remember this: um, most of our projects, because we are IBM and we work with many regulated industries, we discern and decide between what we call as permission network. So permission network example of this: you have a network. You have five banks and these are permission, which means we have to give them authorization, we give them keys to participate in the network. And we know who's participating and the computation requirement of those networks are less because we know who's participating. So we don't have to verify a lot of things with say Bitcoin Ethereum has to do. Now, of course the world is changing. And if blockchain in future becomes a utility, just like internet is the utility, but we have VPNs. I mean, I, I, I talked to my colleagues, IBM people in Japan, in Argentina through VPN. So that is still using a utility and creating a tunnel between the utility from the VPN perspective. We believe that as blockchain systems become more and more prevalent, we have to understand the role of public private models, which is creating a, using a public utility or a transaction system but creating a, a fence for private transactions, which I think is a really, really important case, which Ethereum is looking at, Bitcoin is looking at. And we wanted to basically experience that. And as we were building, looking into utilizing, we partnered with a few entities like Stellar to understand that space because technology wise, we have to understand 
what does it mean to work in a blockchain utility? How can we create businesses, work with our partners to create businesses and create a fence, just like a VPN example, to still able to process transactions, but not with public visibility, for example, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see there's another question in the YouTube chat. Uh, can blockchain reduce corruption or frauds in Latin American countries yeah, or any, any countries in the world? <laughs> yes. Uh, so this is interesting, right? Because most countries we work with, especially for the central banks and tax, tax section, because a lot of, so when you have cash, there's a lot of fraud because cash promotes a lot of fraud in terms of bribes, in terms of corruption. And Digital assets, so remember we talked about this. Anything that's digital can be tracked. Cash, I can hide it in, in, you know, in many ways, uh, in Pablo Escobar style, or I can hide this in my mattress, I can do it in many ways. But with digital, I can track and trace things. So CBDC or central bank issued digital currency, I think has a lot of potential to take away the corruption element of the notion of cash, leave alone cash as a, as today in today's context with COVID-19 as an entity that spreads virus, but it has. But remember this though, that to, to create a system that relies upon a digital transmission of cash and creating digital fiat, you still need the same government people to agree upon it because we're dealing with the same system. We're simply digitizing it. And I believe that many parts of the world that we worked on, while there is a public agreement to work on these projects, there has to be a political will. Uh, to work on this, because at the end of the day, you're still working with the central bank, you're still working with the government to create the system and make the investment in that system. But anything digital can be tracked and traced. And that alone can solve many issues with corruption by removing cash from the system altogether, I think. And if you all have been reading Panama Papers and, and Paradise Papers, a lot of that hiding behind what we call as our shell corporations, a lot of that can be removed because we can track and trace and there's a lot of transparency in system because at the end of the day, whether it's cash or a company that you create has a digital footprint and we can track and trace it. And it's easy to figure out who's doing what by moving money in and out of, of those shell companies. I think it can, it can certainly, I, I, can, I can tell you with many studies that have been done, it certainly can help with rooting out corruption from many countries including not just Latin America, but including countries in Europe and North America, for example. Thank you. Okay, okay perfect, perfect. Okay, it's time. <laughs> the time flew. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, um, I don't know, thank you, thank you all to, to Jessica. I don't know if Jessica is there too. Um, yeah, I'm here. We, 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 we learn a lot of blockchain for business today. And uh, another perspective for me is new. So I'm very happy for, for the knowledge. Good. I'm glad. And thank you so much for the invitation. Hope you all stay safe. And when this is down, I'd love to come down to Cordova. And I heard you have amazing wine there, which is fine. And so we'll <laughs> and we enjoy some uh, time in, uh, in, in Argentina. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bueno, muchas, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias. Jessica, que ahora sí la veo por, en pantalla. Muchas gracias, Jessica, por, por, por también estar y colaborar con, con este nexo. Oscar, muchas gracias por, por, por estar y sumarte también desde, desde la UTN de la CEU y Consuelo desde el Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a todos los que se han sumado y han estado acá aprendiendo un poco, un poco más en este ciclo que también trabajamos de nosotros en casa con la CEU y el ciclo del Ministerio. Eh, con su, unas palabras. Bueno, tal como dijiste, Fran, muchas gracias. Ahora eh, quizás les puedo contar un poco en español también esto de que esta acción conjunta que llevamos a cabo con una de las universidades que es UTN, este nodo de blockchain para Córdoba que se está armando, que está bueno contarlo también en, en español porque, bueno, o sea, muchos de ustedes hay conectado público en general, gente de las universidades próximas o potenciales startups o emprendedores vinculados a esta temática, así que es súper interesante que estén al tanto de que Córdoba está trabajando en la formación de un hub vinculado a lo que es blockchain, tratando de unir 
al sector público, al sector privado a través de las cámaras e instituciones que agrupan a las empresas y a los emprendedores del sector y a las universidades. Así que de nuevo nos parecía una, una súper buena idea hacer este ciclo en conjunto por el día de hoy para traerles esta idea y contarles de que se está armando este, este hub, este espacio de vinculación entre la oferta y la demanda. Tengo esta idea que quiero llevar adelante, tengo esta necesidad, y bueno, la idea es que este año podamos llevar adelante diferentes proyectos, y parte de eso es hacer sensibilización y difundir eh, la temática de blockchain para que más gente le suene eh, familiar, entienda de lo que estamos hablando y, y aprendan, digamos, algo nuevo y cómo esto los puede ayudar en cualquiera de los, de los sectores. Finanzas, seguros, alimentos, eh, como, como muy bien Nita estuvo explicando hoy. Así que, bueno, muchas gracias por sumarse y seguramente nos vemos en próximos encuentros. Exacto, bueno, genial, buenísimo, buenísimo todo. Bueno, quedamos en contacto con cualquier cosa, a través del Ministerio, a través de la Secretaría de Extensión, a través de IBM, buenísimo que se empiecen a, a dar estas, estas, estos vínculos, estos nexos. Así que bueno, nosotros seguimos también, lunes y miércoles de la semana que viene con más charlas, con más invitados, así que los invitamos a seguirnos en nuestras redes y a estar en contacto. Ahora sí, nos despedimos, cada uno en su casa, siguen quedándose en su casa, no salgan si no tienen que salir, y, y bueno, y, y disfruten lo que queda del día. Adiós, adiós a todo el mundo. Chau, chau. Gracias, nos vemos. Gracias. Chau.